Glory. Let's pray together. We pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit, who inspired those words of Scripture to be written, will become their interpreter to us just as we are and where we are in our present lives. For Jesus' sake we ask this. Amen. It was a lesson. <laughs> yeah, let's get a water over. <laughs> It was a lesson before lunch, which is uh, only second worst, I think, to the lesson after lunch. And uh, I was thrilled to be it because I was dealing with the resurrection in this RE lesson. And we'd spend all the lesson looking at all the objections that people had to the resurrection and me demolishing them one by one. And uh, after having demolished all these arguments against the resurrection, I said to the cast, now then, if none of those things are true, what does that mean? And immediately a guy shot his hand up, and I thought, oh, thank you, Lord, revelation. Yes, I said, can we go to lunch, sir, please? <laughs> I thought, what apathy, what indifference to a unique life and a unique truth as well. I'd much prefer that they were antagonistic towards it than complete antipathy and indifference. You see, there were people in Corinth who were very much against the whole idea of resurrection per se. The Greek philosophers believed that the body was a, a kind of a tombstone. The Greek lesson, the, the word for um, a body is soma, and the word for tomb is sema. So they thought about soma, sema, that the body was a prison because inside was this wonderful soul. And when the body died and disintegrated, then they believed that the soul would ascend and enjoy bliss. So the body, you know, was the bad part, and um, the, the soul was the good part. And so if they said that there was no resurrection in Corinth, this was a problem in our reading that Paul had to deal with. And he says, how is it that some of you say there's no such thing as a resurrection? Because if there's no such thing as a resurrection, then that means that the centrality of our faith, that Jesus Christ rose again from the dead, isn't true. If the bodies never rise again and there is no resurrection, then Jesus didn't rise. And, G and Paul says, now, if that is true, if Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead, a number of things resort as a result of, of that untruth. First of all, he says, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then our preaching is useless and empty. If Jesus isn't alive today, then all preaching is useless and empty. And that was said by Paul, who was a preacher himself par excellence. No sooner has he met the risen Lord on the road to Damascus, and he's in the streets of Jerusalem preaching the very truths which he had opposed and not believed a, a few days prior to that. And from the time of his conversion until the end of the Acts of the Apostles where you find him in prison as he was awaiting the resort of an appeal he'd made to Caesar, even there it says, with great boldness, with great boldness he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter had preaching in his blood. If you cut him into bits like Western Rock, you'd find Jesus and the gospel and preaching all the way through him as well. From the time he was converted, for something like the next 20 years or so, he preached and he preached and he preached. He preached over this period of 20 years or so in probably 50 cities at least that we know of in the Acts of the Apostles. So he must have preached hundreds and hundreds of sermons because sometimes he stayed in a place, you know, for days or for, for weeks. And uh, even when he was in a town for a short time, he'd often preach a couple of sermons as well. So his life had been consumed by his preaching. And his preaching was driven by the conviction, A, that God on the road to Damascus had called him and entrusted him to share the good news about Jesus Christ uh, with those who were Gentiles in particular, but also with the Jews. And the cornerstone of all the New Testament teaching and preaching was that Jesus was alive. Paul knew Jesus was alive. He'd met him on the road to Damascus. He was the last of the apostles uh, to meet the Lord Jesus Christ alive. But nevertheless, it was no hallucination. It was a truth which turned his life inside out and upside down and back to front as well. So his whole mission was to preach. And as you read the Acts of the Apostles, you say, well, Paul, however did you continue to preach the way you did? 
Because if you look at his letters and you look at the Acts of the Apostles, you'll find that he carried on preaching even though he was ridiculed by some who were listening to him. He was denounced. He was dismissed. He was the object of sarcasm. He was laughed at. He was criticized. He was accused of being a very poor, ineloquent preacher compared to others who preached uh, uh, around him as well. And yet despite all these criticisms, the Apostle Paul continued to preach. And he says to the Corinthians, I may have experienced hunger and I've experienced thirst because of my ministry of preaching. I've been times when I, 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 I've been in rags as well. <laughs> you won't believe this. I took the communion. Uh, yeah, I took the communion in the last service. I got half the communion service on my next sheet. <laughs> there we are. <laughs> and the other half in the car. Don't go and get it. <laughs> yes, yes. What was I saying? <laughs> Sorry? I'm glad you're listening. I was testing you. <laughs> he'd been hungry, he'd been thirsty, he'd been in rags as well, but nevertheless, he had continued to preach and to preach and to preach. And the message which was at the center of his preaching was, I serve a risen master. Jesus died, Jesus is risen, and Jesus will come again. And he says, now, if Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead, all my sermons have been wasted. All the time I spent preaching have been wasted. And he says, what really uh, word he uses, my preaching has been empty. And it's though Paul had come to each city with a treasure chest. And he said to the people, in this treasure chest, I've got great riches. If you read Ephesians, you'll find that's one of his favorite words there. And as he opened the treasure box, he would be able to say, look, in this treasure box, I can preach forgiveness of a holy God to a sinful person like you. I can preach of a God who loves you and demonstrated his love for you by sending his son to die upon the cross. I can bring you hope to you and a hope of glory as well. I can tell you that death has lost its sting, the grave has lost its victory, because Jesus Christ has overcome sin and death. He's a risen Savior, and I've got all these riches to share with you. But he says, if Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead, I can stand before you, and I can open the box, and find that the box is absolute empty. I've got nothing to share with you of value at all. I've got no riches to give you. If Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead, my preaching is empty and futile. Now that's a sobering thought for those of us who, who, who preach, isn't it? So all the ministry that, that Paul gave was an absolute waste of time. All the journeys that Wesley undertook and the sermons he preached across the country, absolute waste of time. All the time, the preparation that Nick takes in his sermons, absolute waste of time. I found a box of sermons of mine in the, in, in the garage the other day. Didn't know why I kept them. Nobody's going to read them. I remember me listening to one, one minister who was, came back after retirement, and he said, uh, I didn't realize how dry my sermons were until I tried to burn them. And, uh, <laughs> but all... You know, I started preaching when I was... 14, that's right. So I've been preaching about 70 years nearly. Um, what an absolute waste of time. All the time I spent studying, all the time I spent preparing, all the time I spent standing delivering, all the agony I went through in the tension before I actually preached. Absolutely waste of time if Jesus hadn't risen from the dead. But, and this is where you good anglers come in, Christ is risen. Not many good Anglicans here this morning, are there? (laughs) They're all sat in the front row. Most Anglicans sit in the back row. Uh, Christ is risen. Risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Good. So my preaching isn't in vain. My preaching isn't in vain. Nick's preaching isn't in vain. Because right at the center of our message is the truth that Christ Jesus rose from the dead. And the second thing is this, that if my preaching is in vain, if Christ didn't rise from the dead, the second thing is, any faith you've got in Jesus Christ is futile as well. Any faith you put in the Lord Jesus Christ is absolutely futile if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. What's in the name, we sometimes say, and today, particularly with celebrities, there isn't much in the name at all, is there? So the Beckhams, every time they look at their son, they know what they got up to in Brooklyn many, many years before. 
Kate Winslet and Ned Rock and Roar, I didn't know that bloke existed even, they decided to call their son the Bear Blaze. Bear Blaze, as though rock and roll wasn't bad enough. The Bear Blaze. And they explained that within the pair actually met, there was a fire in which they met in the hotel. But names are in actual fact important, aren't they? They tell you something about the person and sometimes about the character uh, as well. So, for example, some of your surnames may tell you where your ancestors originally lived. So if you are called Ford, you may well find that uh, they originally lived near a Ford. Some names tell you what your ancestors did. So if you're a butcher, a baker, I've not come across candle maker as a surname myself, um, or a smith, um, that would tell you something too uh, uh, about uh, your ancestors and the things which they did. I'll be honest, I don't like the name Jeffrey. I never liked the name Jeffrey, and nobody else seems to either. They're always idiots on TV, have you noticed? If you've got an idiot on TV, he's called Jeffrey. And, um, so, and, and nobody, all these old names are coming back. Put, put your hand up if you know anybody who's called their son Jeffrey. Nobody, nobody. So I used to compensate myself. This is, by the way, I used to compensate myself. I was saying, well, you've got a nice surname, Treasure, haven't you? Yeah. And all the old ladies that I used to meet, uh, you know, they'd always say when I was a youngster, what a lovely name you've got. Treasure by name, treasure by nature. And they didn't know what I was like at all. <laughs> But, you know, I had a shot the other day. I, bought a, I, I went into a bookshop in Wimborne. I thought, uh, well, I'd better buy a book. And I got a book on surnames. And I found that treasure is the same as treacher, and it means devious or evil. <laughs> <laughs> so don't get, I still like it, but I mean, <laughs> that, was, that was a bit of a letdown, wasn't it? What about those people who followed the Lord Jesus Christ? They weren't called Christians, were they, until we get into Acts chapter 11 at Antioch. That's where they were first called Christians. And uh, before that, some were called the, uh, the Nazarenes uh, because they followed Jesus of Nazareth. And of course, Paul was going to persecute in Acts 9 those who were of the way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And they were regarded uh, as people who followed the way that Jesus had taught. But the most common name for Christians in the early church was the believers, the believers. We don't use that much, but over 30 times you find the believers as a title uh, to uh, uh, designate those who followed the Lord Jesus Christ. Because that summarized really their distinctiveness. They had a core set of beliefs that they held to be very, very true, including that Jesus rose again from the dead. And that marked them out as distinctive from the Greeks and from the Romans and even from the Jews as well. They believed what Paul described as the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the uh, Acts 15, uh, Paul goes on to describe what this gospel is. What is it that marks out the Christian? It's this, Christ died for our sins according to the scripture and was buried and rose on the third day according to the scriptures. That's what the Christians believed that nobody else believed unless they had the name believers or followers of Jesus Christ. So the central message that the Christians embraced in their belief was that Christ had died. The cross was central uh, to the life and to the beliefs and to the practice of all Christians. Secondly, he died for our sins, for my sins and for your sins. It wasn't that he was condemned because of something that he had done wrong. Eventually, they had to, uh, the enemies of Jesus had to get some uh, false witnesses and their stories clashed with each other and were dismissed. Jesus, Peter says, was without sin at all. And Peter, who'd followed the Lord Jesus for three years, uh, 24-7, so to speak, saw nothing in his life that was a blemish or a sin at all. So Jesus died, but he didn't die, the gospel says, for his own sins. He died for our sin, it said. And Peter goes on to say he bore our sins in his body on the tree. So they believed that the cross was central. They believed that Jesus died for sin, but not his own, but uh, ours. And it was all according to the scriptures. And that is simply saying that this was 
part of God's very purpose and plan, Peter says, from before eternity. It was all part of God's plan that the Lord Jesus Christ should die upon that cross, and it was all part of God's plan that he should rise again from the dead as well. And the result is that if we believe that, and that becomes our core belief, then we have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we really bank our lives upon the truth of Jesus being who he said he was. And Paul is saying if there is no resurrection, you've backed to failure. You've made a mistake. You've wasted your life on somebody who was just uh, an, uh, an ordinary person. He wasn't who the Christians say that he was. But now is Christ risen from the dead? And so the gospel is authenticated by his resurrection. We know that Jesus did die because there's historical evidence outside of the gospels for his death. Uh, we know that uh, he died, we believe, according to God's purpose. Now, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then he was an ordinary person. A bit extraordinary, but nevertheless ordinary in the sense that you and I born, live, and die. So if he was an ordinary man, then his death had no effect upon my salvation at all. He died as a martyr. It was the end of life of a deluded man who believed he was somebody who in actual fact he wasn't at all. Or his death was simply a supreme example of love and the extent to which it would go to. Or maybe his death was the fact that he was an insurrectionist like the two who died on either side of him and he was getting the just punishment for the wrong that he'd done. Or it was a premature death of a first century Palestinian and his death was no different from the hundreds of Rome people that Romans crucified from time to time. And there's no power in his death. The box is empty, like I said. I've got nothing to offer you because a martyr can't save you. An example can't save you. An insurrectionist can't save you. An ordinary human being can't save you. And so without the resurrection... You've got no grounds for your faith at all, and your faith, says uh, Paul, is absolutely futile as well. But now, he says, Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Thank you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so Jesus Christ is risen. So my preaching isn't futile, maybe lots of other things, but it's not futile. Because the message I share we, uh, when I do preach uh, is the message of the truth of God about me, about you, about himself, and about the Lord Jesus Christ. So because Christ is who he is and he rose from the dead, my preaching is not in vain and your faith is not in vain as well. New atheists would like to encourage you that you're, you're, you're a sad lot believing what we believe. You need a cushion in life. Uh, you know, to, to, to take the bumps when life comes along. You need an imaginary friend like a small child that you can unburden to, but, but there's nobody listening because he doesn't exist. But because Jesus Christ froze from the dead, says the Apostle Paul, your faith is anything but futile, and my preaching is anything but empty as well. The fact is that the resurrection and the truth of that resurrection transformed a small group of people locked away in a room in Jerusalem to enable them to go into the streets of Jerusalem at a time of a festival and the previous festival had been the one when Jesus had been arrested and had been crucified and to stand before those people and say you thought you had your way when you crucified Jesus with your wicked hands but hey you were actors in a drama which God had written and you were merely fulfilling all that God had planned and that God has purpose. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is risen, they changed the world. They changed the world. And they wouldn't have done that on a lie and on deceit, but on the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our hymns were, were reminding us earlier on, because of the resurrection, death has been conquered. And the grave has lost its victory. We can stand in an open grave and we can say, well, grave, where's your victory? Where is your victory? Because if Jesus Christ rose from the dead, he says in this chapter, he was the first fruits of all of us who believe. So I really believe that when the Lord Jesus Christ returns again, because Jesus rose from the dead, believers are going to rise from the dead as well. And because Jesus had a resurrected body, in a way which we find, find hard to understand, we're going to have a resurrection body as well. No pain, 
No pain, no deformity, no, 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 no disability, uh, no, no illness. A resurrected body to live in glory with the one who arose from the dead himself. So let's be confident today and let's remind ourselves that the preaching you hear week by week here isn't futile. The box is full and your faith isn't empty and futile either. Whatever people say, whatever doubts we may have from time to time, and we all have those from time to time, I'm sure. The fact is that the grave was empty when the disciples came and the angel said, he's not here. He is risen. Let's live in the truth and the glory of that day by day. Amen. Let's pray. So, Lord, ingrain, tattoo this truth of Jesus' resurrection uh, upon our lives. May it be something which is central to our living, central to our faith, central to our witness. And, Lord, while others may scoff, give us the courage to stand true because Jesus died, Jesus is risen, and Jesus will come again. Amen. Amen.